Hello and welcome. Tonight we're looking at working with colour in Affinity Photo. First of all, who am I? I'm Elaine Giles. Um, if you don't know me, I'm a long-time trainer, podcast host, love my software, and at the moment I'm particularly working intensively with Affinity stuff, Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer, and I can't wait for Affinity Publisher. But let's get back to what we're looking at tonight, which is working with colour in Affinity Photo. I had a look around when I was trying to um, work out what Affinity Photo was doing with colours and how I could best make it work for me. And there wasn't much in the way of guidance as to, there was lots of things about here's one feature, Oh, and here's another video on another feature. But there was nothing that seemed to pull it together. So that's what I'm in, I'm hoping to do tonight for everybody. So quick overview of what we're actually going to cover. So it'll be an hour and a bit of a video and you might think I'm not sitting through all of that. What will it cover? So I'm going to give you an overview of what it will cover. So there are different types of colour that you can work with within Affinity. So you've got RGB, CMYK, lab colour, grayscales. Um, you can select those when you create a new document and I'll be looking at what you need to do in regards to that. I'll also be talking about the global colour picker, which doubtless if you've looked at Affinity Photo, you will have found and you will be trying to work with. When I first looked at it, when Affinity Designer was in beta, so even before, long before Affinity Photo, I found it quite cumbersome to work with. But once you know how it works, the whole thing is a whole lot easier. So I'll be sure to cover that. There's also a colour picker tool, which is completely separate from the global picker tool. So we need to look at that as well. Then when you're working with colours, it's far better if you can work with swatches and group them together. But when you try and do that, there are three kinds. There's document swatches, application, uh, actually palettes, document palettes, application palettes and system palettes. <gasps> so many things. What on earth do you do? Why would you use one over another? Is there a benefit? I will cover that as well. There's also very unfortunately a huge range of file formats for working with colours. Um, swatch formats. There's ASE, ACO, CLR, AI and Affinity palettes, that's just a few. There are actually about three or four times that that I actually found. Those one there are the common ones. And what you're going to need to know to, to leverage your existing content and content that you can download for free from the internet is how you can take those file formats and get Affinity Photo to understand them. And that is what we will be doing tonight. So let's go in and actually have a look at it. So let me get into Affinity Photo. Right, first of all, interface, what have we got? What can we do with it? So first of all, I mentioned there was a global color picker. So, so we can use that and have a look at it. I am going to go into Affinity, here we are, and I'm just going to put a square on there. Bit of a dodgy square, a rectangle. And the color picker in question is up at the top here. Um, now, actually, I'm on the swatches palette and I should be on the color panel. So in the color panel, you have this little symbol. It's a circle and there is an eyedropper next to it and it sits there. And my first impression was it was giving me um, information rather than being interactive. And it came as quite a revelation to understand that I can actually click on there and drag it. And when I drag it, I get this uh, loop, colour loop really. And I can move it anywhere over the interface. And as I do, I'm getting a preview underneath with some RGB values as well. And it's showing me that it's white. And as I move across the uh, color around it, it's going black. And I get up to a bright color, which I've got in here somewhere. Let's see, there's a green one. It's got a border of green on it. I'm actually holding down the mouse pointer at that point. I am actually uh, still holding it down. The reason is as soon as I release it, it will load the color that I'm hovering over into the little dot. So let's go with that yellow and then back over to the right hand side. And you can see that the dot, instead of being black as it was previously, um, it's now got the yellow in it that I was hovering over. So as I say, that was from anywhere on my screen not just the working area, the white canvas area, anywhere on my screen, including the interface of Affinity Photo, but also it goes more than that. If I take, if I click on there and drag it out again, so I've dragged it out, I can actually go off the main screen. So I'm going to head to my left and you're going to see it disappear off the screen. It's gone onto my secondary monitor where I've got Microsoft OneNote, which has a purple stripe on the top. 
And as I let go, it loads in the purple that I selected off another screen. So it is not just my canvas working area, not just the interface of Affinity Photo. It's actually anywhere on any screen that you have attached to your, your computer. Right. But when you've loaded that into there, it hasn't actually applied it anywhere. It's a two step process. So with the shape selected, so I've got my rectangle selected, I can go back to the colour that I've just loaded into my eyedropper there and click once on it. And when I click on it, that is when it applies it. I find that there's a positive and a negative with that. It's great sometimes when I want to go and pick a colour, but I don't want to use it right at this second. But I will do when I've drawn something extra and then I want to colour it. But other than that, if I've got the, the element I want to work with, it's a bit of a pain to have to do it twice. That's just one thing that you will have to be aware of. So that is your col that's within the colour panel that you get that. But you will also see that eyedropper in many other locations. So just to show you, as I go over to the swatches panel, the eyedropper is in there. As I go up to the uh, context sensitive toolbar, there is fill and stroke. And when I click on there, there is also the eyedropper. So it's pervasive across the interface and it does exactly the same job. So if I dragged it from up there and I went down and we'll choose a green in here. You don't really have to do it that way, but I will. It um, will select that what it should do. Let's have a look. You're not doing that. You're not picking it up from there. Let me see if you'll pick it up from here. You'll pick up that. Won't pick it up from its own interface. So if I want a green, I'm going to have to find somewhere green to put it. There we are. And I can then click to apply it. So once you know where that is, and once you know that it actually is giving you more than just feedback, that it is actually interactive, then you can start to work with it. So I'm just going to go back to the colour panel because this is where I work with an individual colour. We have not yet taken to looking at multiple colours in terms of swatches and palettes. We're just looking at individual colours at this stage. So that's how that actually works. Now, because I've got next to this, I have two circles. In fact, I've got three if you count the one underneath. I've got the green one, the black one, and the one with that's white with a, a red line through it. And what that is, that allows me to make something transparent. So as I click on that, it actually applies it to the circle that I have at the front. So the one that was green is now transparent. If I just undo that, that will make it green again. How it works is the white one with the red line through it makes either the black or the green one transparent. Now, what's the difference with the black and the green and how do you get to the black one? The green one is the fill. The one at the back that's black, that's the stroke. And how you bring them to the front, how you swap them over is the arrow next to it. And when you do that, it does actually swap them. It actually swaps the colour that's in the back one to be at the front and vice versa. So if on this one, I wanted it to have that green fill, I need to flick it over. If I want to leave the green fill, but I want to apply something horribly lurid, like a purple stroke to it, I can actually click on the black circle to bring that one to the front. And now when I'm using my colour picker and I'm going around, so let's go up here and get a purpley colour. It's actually going to apply to, well, it should be applying to the stroke. There we go. It applies to the stroke. Now, you're looking at it and you're thinking, really? Can't see that too well. Well, let's move in. It is actually there. It's very, very faint. That's because it's only one pixel, probably. So if I go over to, um, I can actually change that. If I go in here, I should have a strokes panel somewhere, which I usually have displayed. So um, let, let's go to the interface and get that. No, it's not there, not there. Um, I shall come back to that. That's what I'll do. But it is actually, the, oh, there's the stroke up the top. Good grief. There we go. And it's set to one pixel. So I will make that much bigger. There we go. So you can see it. Uh, you'll also notice at that point it became much sharper. Um, I am zoomed into a very large level, so I will zoom out so you can see it. So that's how you work with these circles. The higher one, not necessarily at the front, it's at the front at the moment, but it won't be if I click on that one. So the higher one, the one that's purple at the moment is referring to the stroke. The lower one that is green at the moment is referring to the fill. The circle below the white one with the red through it is making it transparent. And next to that, you have your global color picker. And that is how all of that works. Once you've got that 
Understood. Once you've grasped that, the rest is really easy. And that's when I would move on to the colour picker tool just to show you the difference. So I shall come out of the zoom there and just show you the difference here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate that shape and you get into the colour picker tool with the I key. Uh, let me have a look. That is up towards the top. Here is the tool. I use the I key. It's the colour picker tool. Now, the colour picker tool, you might think to yourself, well, why on earth the two of them? You've got the other one from over there. The great thing with this is it works slightly differently. I've got this selected and I've got um, colours that I can pick up there. And as I click on a colour, so I'm clicking on the purple, it has filled the element that I have selected straight away. There was no need for it to load it into the colour picker up in the right hand corner on the colour panel and then I have to go and click it. It does it all in one manoeuvre. It actually goes in and it does the job in one. Now, you might think then, well, I'll never use the other one. I will always use that one. But there's a downside to it as well. One of the problems with it is um, it only can select from within the canvas area. So as I'm moving around and I'm choosing different colours, so at the moment I'm choosing the purple, or I'm choosing the green, it's on the canvas. But if I move my mouse pointer up, you can see instead of it being a crosshair, it changes to a mouse pointer and I can no longer select anything. So the eyedropper tool is fantastic, but it can only actually work within the image. So if I actually open an image, I can show you that. So I'm going to open up an image of Bruno, Bruno the dog and um, get my eyedropper on Bruno. And as I'm selecting the colours, you can see it's loading the colour in up here. So it is actually making the selection. So I'm going for much lighter. Let's go for that orange bit. It's making the selection, but I can't select outside. So it's fantastic for working with an image like that one that I want to sample colours from, even if I wanted to do something like colour something else. So if I was putting this on a website and I wanted a button at the top, I can get my eyedropper tool and I can work through and I can get a colour that will complement that image and it does it all in one. It's just the downside is it is only from anything on the canvas area. So why would I choose that one then? And that's because there's things that the colour picker tool can do that the global colour picker can't do. So how do you know that? Well, on your context sensitive toolbar, the first option is apply to selection. And you've seen that in action. That's when I have a selection and I then go in and choose a colour from somewhere else. That's what apply to selection means. If I take the tick out of the box and I go back and do that, nothing changes. It doesn't apply to the selection. It's not doing that. So if yours doesn't do that, make sure the tick's in the box if that's what you actually want. The next thing is it's saying the source is global but you could limit it to a layer, which if you think of how the global color picker works, you can't. So I'm going to leave this one set to global, but if you did have certain elements on certain layers, you could restrict it to a certain layer. If, again, if you've got problems trying to pick a color and you're thinking this isn't the right color, do check that you've got global set up there rather than a specific layer. Now, the other thing it can do is much more useful, which is called presets. And when I open up the presets, you can see that the first one says point uh, one by one. What that's referring to is the sampling area. So as I moved across the dog, it was only picking up the value of a single colour. And if you look at an intricate design like that, particularly like a sky or a background, choosing one particular pixel might not give you the result you're looking for. You might look at it and think, oh, I didn't think it was that colour. That's not the impression I'm getting looking at the overall image. And that's what these other options are for. They allow you to take a colour, to select a colour based on an average. And the average it's referring to when it says three by three and five by five is the size of the grid around it. So let's go and try that. So with it set to point, I'm going to go down and choose this sort of what would you say, greenish colour in the middle. But that greenish colour is much greener at the bottom and up here it's sort of yellowy and then it goes to a peach colour. So I'm not really quite sure if that is the colour that I was aiming for. And that's why you would go back up here and choose three by three. And you get a slightly different colour. The bigger you go, the more different that colour is. 
So if I go right up to 65 and try that, it is slightly different. It's giving you a different color. It's that it's an average value rather than the value of a single pixel. Now, I made a mistake when I did this and I chose one of the really big ones. And um, I had a blue and it was a very deep blue and I expected it to be pretty similar, that it would be blue of some description. And it came in and it was incredibly pale. And I thought, why on earth is it so pale? And then I realized I'd, I'd picked it from a layer and the rest of the layer was transparent or it was white. And it had used a lot of the white, even though I'd clicked right on top of this really deep blue. So we've chosen the 257, which is the biggest we can get. And as I'm going across this, if I'm clicking on the lighter bit of Bruno, you can see it's nothing like the orange color that we had before. And that's because the grid, which is 257, is taking in a lot of the black fur around Bruno. So if I click on the white bit in the middle, it's nothing like white. It's still brown. And that's because it's taking in so many different colors. If I click on virtually the same point with a five by five grid and it's, it's almost white. So it's very, very handy to do that. Works great for skies, works great for backgrounds like on this one. But I would say try and keep it as tight as possible to give you the effect that you're looking for rather than going for something really huge and thinking that you're going to get a better average. It very much depends on the image, the type of image you're working with. But that's one of the things that the colour picker tool can do that the global colour picker doesn't do. So the differences were it's restricted to the design area, just the canvas area of Affinity Photo. Uh, it is a single step process. You only need to do that once if you have the tick in apply to selection. So that option that was up in the left hand corner, if you have that checked, then it's a single step process. There are the presets that are available to give you an average. And because of that, you can take an average, which you can't do with the other color picker. Now, those are the two options you've got when it comes to picking color from within Affinity Photo. There are lots of other ways of picking color with third party applications, but that's what you've got within Affinity Photo. And that's what this color panel is all about. Now, the color panel, the view I have of it at the moment is the default view, which is the color wheel. But it's got hidden depths in here as well. There is a menu option, as is common with virtually every panel um, in Affinity Photo. And if I click on that, you get extra options. So this one is showing you the color wheel. And again, I found that rather strange when I first started working with Affinity Photo. I wasn't used to having a wheel. I'd had sliders and I'd had boxes and things like that, but I hadn't had a wheel. If you just cannot go get used to that, you can change how the entire color panel works. So you can go to sliders and now you can slide about to select colors using your RGB. You'll notice in here as well, you also have opacity. So you can change the opacity in there too. So I'm changing that, that um, what we said was going to be a button in this top corner in here. So uh, let's just, there we go, it's back, it's back. It's zooming me in slowly. There we go. So you can see it going, moving in there with these sliders, but you're not even limited to that. You also have what it calls boxes. Now, I thought that doesn't look much like boxes to me, but it actually is. It's sort of boxes of colors, but this one happens to be um, a wide range of colors. But if you go in here, you can change how that actually looks as well. So there are multiple levels in here to work with this. This way, it would allow you to choose at the top. So it's, it's in a way it's similar to the uh, color wheel. The first one, you can choose it at the top and then you can change the hue of that underneath. So that's how that one works. And the last one you've got is tint. And that's pretty sim simple. All it does is change the tint of a single color. It doesn't allow you to change that color. You've got the opacity, but you're working within a single color there. So there it is. And I'm trying to get that back up there. And then I'm trying to click on here. That's right. So deepest color right down to virtually transparent. So you're changing the tint with that. So if you're working with Affinity Photo and you think mine doesn't look like that, do go up here and have a look at that. And you may find that you've got it set to wheel sliders, boxes or tint. Now, the other options that you've got in here are you can copy a color to your clipboard as a hex value. If you're never, ever, ever going to use a hex value, then don't worry about it. But it's great to be able to copy a color as a hex value, which as an aside is how all color is stored. It's a computer. It doesn't store it as, as a color. It stores everything as a number. And each color has a value and it's, it can be expressed in RGB or hex or other 
different formats. But hex is a very common one. It's used in CSS for web um, sites uh, and elements on the web. You can also paste that into various applications. So if I do copy that as a hex value and then I go over to the swatches and I'm just going to choose a different swatch. So I'm not going to worry too much about which one. I've got one in here and there's nothing on there yet. What I will do is I will add a swatch to it. Don't worry about this. I'm going to come back and explain all of this. But the reason I'm showing you this is you can actually go in here and you can see if I go into my uh, Oh, you're not on that one, are you? Oh, that's not great, is it? I was going to show you actually pasting it in and it's not having it. Let's see if we can edit it and do it that way. No, it's not going to let us do that. I, I will find a different way to do that. OK, so I'm just going to go back in here just to show you that you can actually copy it. Uh, what I will do is I will I will paste that somewhere. Where can I paste that? That's pretty safe. Let me open up pages. I've got nothing in pages, I don't think. Make a new file in pages and just show you that if I paste that in, that is that colour value. Have a zoom in to show you that. That is the value of that sort of brownish color. The hash at the beginning tells me that it's a hex code and the six digits after it, which can be certain letters and numbers, actually tell me what value that is. So that is what a hex code looks like. But as I say, you may never need to even think about it. And if you don't have a need to think about it, don't worry about it at all. If you're not going to use that, then don't worry about it. Just that you can actually do that. You can also add colour to swatches and add chords to swatches. But before we do that, you need to know what swatches are all about. So that's the basics of the colour in there. But as I said, it's much more powerful if you can pull these together and work with multiple colours. And that's what the swatches panel is all about. So by default, I think that was on greys, wasn't it? Usually when you go in, it is on greys. It does have some of the same options as you had on the colour panel. So let's have a look what it's got that's the same. It has the transparency swatch, which is the white one. It has the stroke swatch, which is the black one. It has the fill, which in this case is the brown one. It has the eyedropper tool, which works exactly the same way as it did on the last panel. It also has opacity. It's just in a different place, but it works exactly the same way. That's when it starts to change. It starts to get different at that point. Um, let's have a look at it. Let's take it back to the default, which was the wheel. That's what the wheel looked like. But you go into the swatch, the top little bit's the same, but this one's actually more useful to work with. I actually spend most of my time in here once I've decided what colours I'm working with. First thing it gives you, which is incredibly useful, is this recent row of colours. And what it shows you is the recent colours that you've actually just used. So if I switch those over and I go, uh, oh, no, I don't want to do it. I want to, don't want to do that. I want to bring that one to the front. If I do that, I can just change the colour of what's selected by choosing from the recent list. Now, obviously, there's only a couple in here, but if I'd gone through and I'd applied lots of different greys and work through it, you can see it's changing this colour here to lots of different greys. So that will start to build up as I work through this. When you look back at it in a few minutes, you'll see that there's more colours in it. So the area that you've got down here starts off with where it says the word greys at the moment. And when I bring that up, you can see within there that you've got lots of options. And these are saved swatches. You have by default greys, colours and gradients. And you will all have those if you have Affinity Photo installed. Now, I'm going to point out that these top three have a certain icon. And that's actually the Affinity icon. That indicates to you that these are application palettes. They are only available within Affinity Photo. And I do mean within Affinity Photo. Just because they're in Affinity Photo does not mean they'll be available in Affinity Designer, much less any other application. They won't be. It is just within Affinity Photo. As I move down, you'll see there's a range of other palettes. And some of these don't look like they're global. They're not. There should be four by default, depending on what software you've got installed. But you should always have four. You should always have WebSafe, Crayons, Apple and System. They will be the default ones. You'll notice in here I have Scrivener. That's because I have Scrivener installed and Scrivener installed its own palette. The other ones, so uh, Affinity, Microsoft Office 2017 from Affinity Designer, our parishes, uh, Microsoft, that's one of mine. Screenflow 7 is one of mine. So what I've done is I've created extra palettes. 
And because those palettes have the little apple icon next to them, that tells you that they are system palettes. That means they are available in every application on your computer that uses the Apple Color Picker. They are global to this particular computer. And the reason that I tend to use those rather than application palettes is because if I've got a range of colors that I'm working with for a client, so I'm going to activate here the Our Parishes one, which if you've been with me before, you will have seen. There's only a few colors here, just a few. Uh, there's seven of them and they're all very, very pasty, I'll admit. Um, but those are the colors that I work with. And if I'm in Affinity Photo and I want to put some text on an image to put on their website, I want the right colors. But I also want those colors if I'm in Keynote or if I'm in Pages and I want the exact same colors. So I made a system palette. I'll show you how you can do that. That makes my life a whole lot easier. Before I could do that, I had to carry around swatches with me and then pick them from an image, which isn't the greatest thing to do. So that is why they have the Apple icon next to them. The other options you've got in here are these Pantone ones. So that will give you, if you're working with printed material and you need absolutely spot on colour, then you can use defined colours from the Pantone range. You will possibly remember when I started this and we looked at the slides, I mentioned three types of palettes and we've only got two there plus the Pantone. The third type was document palettes and a document palette is a range of colours that is only available to this particular file. So it will be an Affinity Photo file. It will have its own color palette, but it will only be available when that individual file is opened. So there are three types. There are the application palettes, the system palettes, and the document palettes. At this stage, before we go on to look at anything else, it's not too important at the moment. Uh, what I will do I'll leave it set to that while I explain the rest of what's at the top and then we'll go and create one. The next option you have here is this little, it looks like a palette icon and it says add current fill to palette and that's exactly what it will do. So if I have this set to my fill, this kind of burnt brownish pinky thing, if I want that adding, it will actually add it and it's added it at the beginning there just added it as another colour to the palette that I have active and that's the one in the drop down list. Going across to the right hand, hand side, I then have four little swatches on their own and they are they're actually really handy. I find myself using black and white from there virtually all the time. The first one's transparent, the second one is black, the third is 50% grey and the last one is white and they are pervasive. They will stay there no matter what you have selected. And they are the colours that Affinity Photo deems necessary for you to have access to, irrespective of the palette you have activated. So that's what they are. Moving down then, you actually have the swatches that form part or all of the palette you have selected in that drop down. That's what those colours are for there. Moving down, you then have an option that you can search for colours. Now, search how? Well, that depends on what the colours are called. I'm winging this. I think I had one called all. I did, luckily. Um, the reason there's two in there is the name of the colours. So if I take that away, you can see, let's zoom, zoom into it so you can see. I've got there my, I've got eight colours now. But as I hover over them, you should be able to see, and it's quite difficult for me because my mouse point is hidden. There we go. One is All Saints. That is the pinky one. If I move just to the left, I've got All Our Parishes. And if I move across to the right, I've got St. Margaret Ward. And if I move one more, oh, that's a Summer Fairs and it's not. That yellowy one there is Our Lady of Lords. So they are different churches within a range of parishes. And I took the time and I named them. But if I move across to this one that I've just put in, which is that pinky one, that one there, it just says our parishes. It doesn't say anything in terms of the name. So knowing that if I type in the word all, I should limit that to two colours. The first one is all saints. The pink one is all saints and the maroon one is all parishes. So you can search by name. This is why it's worth taking the time and naming your colours, because you can have, obviously I've got nine colours in here, eight or nine colours, but you can have quite a lot of colours in here. If we look at some of these other options, particularly these Pantone ones, you can see whole ranges of colours, swathes of colours. 
And if you've got something like that, the ability to search for them by name is immensely useful. So it is worthwhile taking the time to name them. So I'm going to go back to the one we had. Right, so that's the searching. It looks like that's all you can do from that panel. But if we go up to the menu, you have other options. And this is where you start working with palettes. So I will work through these, but first of all, I'm going to show you how to make a new palette. Uh, so what we have available within here is these palettes. You need to know the difference between the system, the application and the document. But once you've got that, you can then start to work with it. So this document here at the moment, I'd like a color palette for it. That's the start. And I'd also like, let me get out to the full view, to load into it some of these colors. That would be most useful. So up here, you can add palettes. The thing being, you have to know the difference between the type of palettes before you can actually do it, because you need to know which one to add. Now, I have a preference, if possible, to use system palettes. That's just my personal preference. You may choose to use something completely different. My rationale is, as I've said, I want these, I'm going to probably want these colors available across multiple applications. And that automatically rules out an application palette and a document palette. However, there are times I will use a document palette. I will explain why as we move on. But for this one, I will say document palette. So I'll add a document palette and it creates it. Now it's automatically there. It's called it unnamed, not helpful. It doesn't prompt me for a name. But then sometimes when you're speed working, you don't want to be stopped and prompted for a name. But with it selected, which it is, you can go back to the menu and choose to rename the palette. And I will put in there Bruno. Marvellous. <laughs> Got to love live demos, haven't you? Never seen that happen before. Not doing that. What I'll do is I will reopen it. Uh, will you have saved my file? Poor Bruno. <gasps> poor, poor Bruno. Didn't even save Bruno. Uh, right. Oh, hang on. Hang on. On the other screen, we do have a message. Um, I have found a recovery file. Would you like to open it? Why not? Restore the unsaved file. Yes. Yes. Let's restore it. Oh, you found that one as well, did you? Marvellous. Let's just concentrate on Bruno. Let's see if his colour palette was there. It was. So his unnamed colour palette, as we were, as we were. Not a crisis, she said. Probably a good idea to save this file at some point, though, isn't it? Which I'll do right now, because at the moment it's saved as... Um, you save me. You are, aren't you? It's saved as a, as a JPEG, but now it's saved as an Affinity Photo file. So let's do that before we go any further. Then we'll try renaming it. I'm wondering if it crashed then because it was a JPEG and JPEGs don't support um, their own document palette. But it should have let me do it and then save it. But now it's saved. So here's hoping it doesn't happen again. If it does, I'm afraid Bruno's going to have to be ditched. So uh, what I was doing was renaming the palette. Don't crash. Ah, there we go. Oh, no, we got we got this far, didn't we? We got to the point of putting in Bruno and then it crashed. But now it's fine. So I would say that was because it was a JPEG. Right. So we now have a color palette called Bruno and it's a document palette. So this is the first one that we've seen that's a document palette. So it has the document icon. When I now open that up, you now have all the different types. You have the document palette called Bruno, the application palettes and the system palettes. So you now have all three to look at. So we will be working with the Bruno one. And what you can do with this is literally get your eyedropper. You can go around and select a color and you can then choose to add that to the palette. So as I go through and I select different colors, I'm clicking that button to add it to the palette and it's adding it. So let's get some of his brownie orange fur. Let's add that one and some of the black as well. And that is how you build up the color palette. Once you've got that in there, you can then work with that. That will be saved with this file. Now, as I say, if I go over to this file that we were working with and I go into here, you'll see that we don't have Bruno. It is per file. It is only available for Bruno. So if you wanted it across multiple files, don't make it a document palette. But in this case, that's fine. We'll just go with a document palette for Bruno and he's got his own palette. It's that simple to create a palette. Now, at this point, I'm selecting one there. I'm going to go into there and you can see what else you can do with this. At the moment, 
uh, we've, we've added a palette. We've only added one. We've renamed it. You can delete palettes. So you have full palette management in here. You can set it as the default for different types of color space. Now, I said I would talk about the color space. You have the all the options that you've got. They've got the RGB, the grays, the CMYK, the lab color. If color management is incredibly important to you, then you will have probably some information from your printer or your, your printing company, and you will be able to select that based on how you want your output produced. If you are a little bit hazy on it, stick to the default, because if you stick to the RGB default, you can always change it later. Now, if you have a particular range of colors you always work with, that's what this option is talking about. Make this color palette the default for either each of these, one of these, however you want to work with it. So you can do that from there. Now, I've been working through this and I've created a palette or a few colors from this image, but I did it really slowly. I did it by going around and clicking and adding and clicking and adding. You could actually automate all of this, which is great news. So back up to that menu, you can see create palette from document. And it's talking about a document that you have open within Affinity Photo. Again, you need to specify whether it's application, document or system. Seeing as though it's coming from this document, I'll create it as a document palette and I will just click on there. You will see it's automatically created me a palette. It's called it Bruno 2. It's taken the name from the name of the file and then added a 2 because we already had one called Bruno. And it's added all of the colours that it has picked up from that image. That is a great way of generating a colour palette because it took so little time. So all you would need to do is open up a file and then go to that menu and choose the option I did, which was create palette from document and choose a particular type of palette. Now, let's have a think about that because I said document palette. That's because it was for Bruno. But if what I really wanted was to take these colours and maybe use them in Keynote in a presentation, then it wouldn't have been a document palette. I should give you a couple of seconds to write in which one it is. But I've not got all day because it would take me 30 seconds to read what you put. But I know that mentally you're thinking, oh, Elaine, that would be a system palette. So let's make it a system palette. So I'll create a new palette from the document again, same document, but this time as a system palette. Now this time, it's called it Bruno. Oh, come on, what are you playing at? Shouldn't it have been Bruno 3? No, it shouldn't. The first palette was a document palette that was called Bruno. The second one was a document palette, so it called it Bruno 2. This one is a system palette. There isn't one called Bruno, so it's called it Bruno. It's taken the name from the file. It's picked the same colours again, but now it has added it to my system. Let's prove that. Let's go over to that image that it uh, luckily saved for me. And let's go and have a look at the colour palettes that are available. And there is Bruno. So it wasn't there before, but it is now. So I can choose that. That's loaded it in. And then making sure I've got something selected here. So let's make sure we've got the shape. We're on the green. And we want to apply the orange or the blue. You can apply colours from Bruno's palette to a different document. Not only that, because that's good. That's good. But let, let's find better than that. Where is my I have a pages file? So I'm going to open up my pages file. There it is. It is just a range of square boxes. It would work much better in Keynote, but I'm already using Keynote. That's already running. Uh, what each of these boxes has got is uh, just a fill, just a plain fill there. If I open up this, say in a colour fill, I can choose from a limited range of colours, but that's no good. This option here allows me to see the system-wide colour picker. So I'm going into the system-wide colour picker. Not helpfully, it has opened it on my other screen, but I'll drag it on. There it is. Now, in here, don't underestimate the system colour picker. It looks naive. It looks simplistic, but it's not. It's very clever. Uh, we have extra options in here as we're going in. And if I go into the third tab, so this third one here, which is colour palettes. As I click on that, do these names look familiar? They should do. Apple, Developer, Affinity. Oh, look, Bruno. I can actually load Bruno into the system colour picker. And from there, I can choose all of Bruno's colours. So I can choose any colour that I had in Affinity Photo. So these colours started life uh, inside Bruno's JPEG file. 
and then we took it into Affinity Photo. We extracted the colors from it and we've now opened up pages and we're now working with that palette. We haven't even saved the file yet in Affinity, but because it has saved it as a system wide color palette, it's available system wide. So I will uh, we'll come back to that later. Maybe I'll move it out of the way for the moment. That's to show you the difference. Uh, you'll notice in here that Bruno 2 is nowhere to be seen. Bruno 2 is nowhere to be seen because it is altogether now a document palette. But that one is there to be looked at and used across files. So back into the Bruno file. Because one of the other options that we had in here was, I'm going back to it now, that was create color palette, uh, create palette from document. But there's also create palette from image. Well, they sound similar given that a document is an image in Affinity Photo. But what it actually means is it's going to give you an entire interface to work with. So let's have a look at that. Create palette from image. Not the best, most exciting dialog box I have ever seen, but once I select an image, things will improve greatly. So what I'm going to do is select an image and I'm going into my data file and I've got some images. I have some, this, this one of peaches I have, just a JPEG. I'm going to open that up and it will load it in. And what it does is it has a good old gander at it with an algorithm running and it picks out what it considers to be the primary colors from that image. So it could be a JPEG, it could be a PNG, it doesn't really matter. It will do it from an image. It's an image file format that it's using. More than that, though, you can specify the number of colors. So at the bottom, you have a number of colors and you have a slider. And at the moment, it's set to five, the preview option. Uh, and there's locations and things which we will look at. But at the moment, you can take it down to three. Not that that is making a difference. It should do. It should show me three images, three, three colors. Uh, and I should also be able to take it up. Maybe I have to preview it. Let's preview. There we go. It goes down to three. So let's take that up to sort of 25, 26 and preview that. And you've now got a huge range of colors, 26 of them. If I take that all the way up, you can have 256. And I will preview that and then show you all of the colors available from within there. Now, I don't think much of the time you will choose an image and want 256 colors from it. Because for instance, these two are slightly different, but they look very similar. And these two look very similar too. So usually you want maybe 10, 20, something like that. Not usually more than that. There are exceptions. And one of the exceptions I've got is the Microsoft palette that has a swatch in it for every Microsoft application. And that is there to make my life easier. When I'm uh, in Keynote and I'm making my presentations and I want to put Excel and I want to make it Excel green, I can't remember what color Excel green is. So um, I have it remind me and I use it from a palette. So we've got there, let's make that 20. You can type it in if it's not being precise and then preview that. So I've picked from that 20 colors from that image at the top. When it says location, you should have a clue what this is talking about, because as I click the drop down, it gives me four options, not three, four. It gives me application, system, document and currently selected palette. It would be helpful if it said application palette, system palette, document palette and location might be better if it said palette location rather than just location, because you could be forgiven for thinking, I don't know what, where you're talking about. What are you talking about? But what it means is it's going to create a new palette. And do you want an application, one, a system, one or a document one or the other option, which is to add it to the currently selected palette? So I'll go for that bottom one and add it to the currently selected palette, which is Bruno, which is a document palette and click create. And it adds that in up there. So it adds the extra colors and it puts them actually in front of the colors that were already there. So it's added them to Bruno. I will go back in and I will do that again with a different image. So it was create palette from image go in, select the image and I will choose soap this time. And it's a, a range of brightly coloured soaps. I uh, will choose more images. That's actually quite muted, isn't it? But I will choose. Let's go for eight and preview that. So it, I've got eight colours in there. This time I will make this a system palette. So I'll make sure it says system. Click create. It has added that. And it's called it soap and a lot of numbers. And that's because it's named it after the file. So I will go in and I will rename that palette and we'll call that soap. So we know where it was from, but we don't need all of those numbers. And now I have another 
global to this computer palette. So if I go back into here and I choose my palette, which was soap, there are my options and I can go in and apply those colors in a different image. So we've created a palette from the Bruno image, which is an affinity photo file, which crashed it right royally, but never mind that, we recovered. And we've also created from images, we've created two system wide palettes from two separate images. Right, so good as we're going. All right, moving down, you can change how these display. You could show them as a list. And in that case, it would show you the names. So if it's important to see the names, so let's have a look at that Microsoft Office one. That will make much more sense, won't it? We have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote. And as I scroll, we have Outlook. Now that one's actually a limited one. That's um, Office 9, 2017. But this Microsoft one, there's hundreds of them. There are lots and lots of colors in there. There's InfoPath, Visio, uh, 2013 colors, all sorts in there, Windows. There are Pantone colors that are Microsoft's brand colors. Uh, varying shades of grey, global colour, you name it, they're in there. So there's about 30 or 40 colours in that one. And it's great for me to be able to switch it to that so I can work with it. And I can search for it as well. So if I'm looking for Excel Green, what options have I got for Excel Green? And you'll see there is, there is a slight difference there. Excel 2013 is not the same as the other Excel. Not all Excel Greens are equal. So that's how I work with that. So it's just a different way to display the information. So sometimes a list is more appropriate. Uh, you can also change the size of the swatch. So if I take away that and we go back to just the swatch, but then I go back in and say, make the medium, they go bigger for those, those of us of a certain age who could do with them a little bit bigger uh, and even go up to large as well. You'll also notice there that you have sorting options. So they could be alphabetical. So for me, that would be fantastic for my Microsoft one. But for other ones, maybe Bruno, I might want that sorted by colour. So there are options in there to do that as well. So if we go back to Bruno, where's Bruno's? There's Bruno's. That's not sorted by colour. Doesn't look like it to me. Uh, let's sort that by colour. So go in there, sort by colour, and it should automatically rearrange that. Oh, did that do that? Didn't look like it did. Uh, let's try something and make it alphabetical. Uh, what have we got here? Mm, which ones which one shouldn't I tinker with? <laughs> I'm not sure which ones I shouldn't tinker with. I've got a backup of the Office 2017 one, so I could do that alphabetically, couldn't I? Let's go for that sort alphabetical. And I don't believe this. <laughs> Maybe not sort them. There's an idea. Maybe not sort them. Let me go back into it. <gasps> Affinity, what are you doing to me? You know that thing of it'll be all right on the night? Yeah, it's not, but it was fine in rehearsals. I'm just going to open all of my recovery files. Hopefully it has recovered them. Uh, if it has recovered them in Bruno, I'm going to do a swift check to make sure Bruno's got Bruno and Bruno 2, which he has. I'll save the file while I'm at it as well. Um, and my, obviously at this stage, um, my other palettes are still there because they're not stored in the image. So they were quite safe, crash or not. I think I'm going to leave those sort options. Uh, play with uh, as you dare. I'll leave that to say. OK, so I will go back in and show you the rest of it because the next thing's the important thing. You're probably all screaming at the screen. Oh, no, I've got some stuff from Photoshop. I've got some some palettes from Photoshop and I'd like to import them. Well, the good news is it will, but not all colour palette formats are equal. So as I go in here and say import palette, it wants to know whether it's an application palette, document palette or a system palette. I'm going to go for document to keep things neat and tidy in here. And I have some color palettes. Here are my color palettes. I've got five of them. They are not all equal. I've got Microsoft. I've got our parishes. I've got ScreenFlow. I've also I've got two called ScreenFlow, actually. And the eagle eyed will spot they're not the same file format. One is an ASE and the other is a CLR. I'm going to come back to the difference between them. I'm going to go for the ScreenFlow file, which is an ASE. Now, if you're not sure, an ASE file is an Adobe Swatch Exchange file. And that is the traditional file format for sharing colors from Photoshop and within other, other Adobe applications. So the good news is there are lots and lots of applications that will make Swatch files, ASE files. And you can export them from Photoshop. So I'm going to click open on that and that will load them in. It actually says ScreenFlow 7. I think I uh, renamed it. 
So it's a copy of this one down here, but it's a document one. So it does load it in and it puts it up at the top. So that came from Photoshop and I have loaded it into Affinity Photo. There is no problem trying to read ASE files at all. Here's where you're going to come up with a problem. And this is a big problem that I have heard about online. As I do research, I think, oh, there's an issue with that, is there? I'm going to import a palette. I'm going to choose another document palette. I'm going to go back to my color palettes. And this is my problem. My problem is the top file is the one I want. It's called Golden Beach. I exported that today, 18 minutes past five, to be precise, from Photoshop. And the default in Photoshop now is an ACO file, an Adobe Color file. An Affinity Photo does not read ACO files. Oh no, big disaster. So that is one of the problems. It will not read that file. There are other ways to transfer it. You can probably think of a few, but let's do it the easy way. Right. Now, the, the ways I'm thinking of that, that are horrible is opening up Photoshop and, and making a file and then saving the file as an image and then reading the image. In. No, 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 no. We don't do any of that. Right. I'm going to cancel out of that and I am going to open up my color palettes in a window and I'm going to bring them onto the screen. So here are my color palettes. There is my Golden Beach file. And if I just show you what that looks like, it is an Adobe Swatch file, but I can't even see the colors much less import them. But I have an application, tiny little thing from the App Store, which is called a Color Palette Importer. So I'm going to run that. I think I paid £1.99 for this. Now, it tells you the instructions. It's really simple. Drop the palette here and it will read ACO files, ASE files or CLR files. Or you can select the file. So I'll move it off to the side. This is the one I'm looking for. This is Golden Beach. It's giving me problems. And I'm going to drag and drop it on top of Color Palette Importer. And it imports all of the, the colors. Not only does it import them, it keeps the names. Here's my names. I had a range of beiges for the sand. And I had these sort of ooh, seasidey, beachy colors as well. And they all had names. And it remembers them. Now. I've got it in here, but that's not getting it into Affinity Photo, is it? So how do we get it into Affinity Photo? Well, what I can do is save to a new palette or I can save it to one of these palettes. So I could append these colours to an existing palette. But what palettes is it listing in here? Because at this stage, you're probably going palette blind. These palettes are system palettes. Remember the other types of palettes, document palettes. Well, this application would have no access to document palettes because they live inside a document inside Affinity Designer, in Affinity Photo. It has no access to Affinity Photo palettes because they are locked inside Affinity Photo. Therefore, these palettes must be system palettes because they're the only ones that it can have access to. So, I'm going to make a new palette. I'm going to call it Golden Beach and I'm going to hit import. And what it will let me do is import it into the right location to create a system palette. Now, that location is hidden deep in the depths of your system. It's the colors folder within your library folder. So just to show you where that actually is. From your computer, mine is ludicrously named Serenity. And to be honest, <laughs> I've had no Serenity with it tonight. But there's my hard drive. There's my users folder. There's my actual folder. There's my library. And there is my colors folder. And that's where it's going to put it. And if we look at what's ghosted out here, there are my other system wide palettes. So now you know what a CLR is. It's a color palette file system wide on a Mac. Affinity Bruno from Affinity Designer, Office, all the ones you've seen in the interface. And all I need to do to create my Golden Beach one is just save it and it will save it in there. It's telling me that I where I can find it and how I can edit it and all the rest of it. And I might need to restart target applications. OK, I'm going to say OK to that. I could actually, if I was in here, have changed names. Uh, I could have really fiddled around with this. I can do previews by double clicking on it and then I can click through all of them so I can get preview. It's a great little app for $1.99. But that's all I need to do. I just needed to convert it from an ACO file that it didn't understand into a file that Affinity Photo does understand. 
So when we talked about CLR files, that is what that one was. It's just not in the right place. It's where I would save it and make my backups of it. A CLR file is a system wide color file. OK, so I can lose that onto my other screen. Right. Do I need to reload this? Let's have a look. I'm going to go in to my color palettes and I was looking for one called Golden Beaches, wasn't I? Was it Golden Beach? There's nothing there. There's nothing there in my system. So I will save that file. I will save this file. I will call that boxes, seeing as though everything else has crashed right royally. And what I will now do is close Affinity Photo down. Open it up again. So giving it that restart, I will then load in the Bruno file. So uh, open recent, uh, that was boxes. Let's go and get Bruno, the recent Bruno. There he is. And then go back to the palettes and there is Golden Beach. So I did have to restart the application, but are you going to come on? I'm trying to zoom in there and it's not playing ball with me. There it is. So it did actually load it in, but I needed to restart Affinity Photo for it to see it. But if I choose that, there are the colours that I had available. Now, one of them was called Minty, I think. And if I type in Mint, it will filter and the names came through from there. So that application is absolutely priceless to get colours into Affinity Photo when they've been exported from Photoshop or other Adobe applications in file formats that it doesn't like. So that is doing that with the colour there. So that's importing it in. Now, this Golden Beach one, that's all very well, but now it's a system palette. What if I wanted it to be an application palette? What if I wanted it to be a document palette? Oh, we're getting complicated now, aren't we? Well, we've imported it, but we can also export palettes from Affinity Photo. So if I go to export that, it comes up with Golden Beach as an option. And I'm just going to stick this one on the desktop. So it, it knows the name. It knows that the name that that palette has already it doesn't give me any file formats. You'll notice it's just going to export it. Didn't give me any file formats. I will save that. I will then show you that on the desktop, there it is. And it has saved it out as a CLR. It knew it was a CLR to start with. It has saved it out as a CLR. And I now have a backup of my Golden Beach. And I can then use that to share with people. I can back it up. So it's backed up from my system. If my computer dies, all of my palettes die. So I want to back it up. So you can do that with it. So you can import palettes and you can export palettes as well. So let's get that full screen. Right. So doing nicely so far, aren't we? But we've still got a little bit of a way to go. The colours that we've worked with so far, we've just picked a colour. We've just added it randomly there. Nothing special about these things at all at the moment. But if I wanted to add some text to this and I wanted it to be a particular colour, so I'm doing this for a client, maybe. Um, let's say my, my, my button up here, let's say I want um, a nice colour in my button. We'll go for a sort of lightish colour. But then I want to add some text to it. So I want to put on the um, buy now. You can buy Bruno. Poor Bruno's for sale. There we go. I've, I've just made Bruno for sale. Right, I need that to be a bit bigger. So at the moment it's quite small. That's not bad. 64. And I'll put that on the top of there and I want it to be a different colour. So I'll make it that colour. Now that's fine as it goes, but I want to put more text on here. So as I'm going in here, let me put in, add some text to it. No, don't move around. I want to put Bruno and I probably make that a much nicer font for, for Bruno. No, not Dingbat. So good grief. I'm looking for uh, Zapfino. Is right down the bottom. So there's Bruno and make it bigger. Now, I want to have a colour. Make it that big. I want to have a colour that maybe the client isn't going to be happy with that. And I'm putting this all over the place. Uh, I probably wouldn't be having it saying Bruno, but I might have, you know, like special offer now or whatever. So I've got three elements there that have got a colour on that I take it to the client and they say, love it, but I don't like the colour. I want a different colour. I'm not pleased at that point. I've got to come back into here. I've got to make selections. I've got to actually know what elements I coloured in that way. And then I can change the colour. I don't actually like that one. I think the other one was better. But the client always knows best, apparently. So that's a bit of a problem. But there is a way to work around it. So let's say we work on one element. So this buy now button. And we'll have it that colour, but they didn't like that. So we really need to make it much deeper. So I'll go in and I'll start making it um, a different colour. 
So let's make it deeper. Take it up so it's more of a sienna brown. You're actually changing this. You are, right? So I'm changing that. And let's apply that. So let's say they're much happier with that colour. I've still got to go through here and I've still got to play around and do all of this. Not good. But what I could do when I've got that colour there and I've got it selected is I could choose to make it a global colour. Now, at the moment, I'm just going to show you that all of these colours here are just in squares. They are just squares. There's no indication of anything else. They're just squares. If I go up to the top here, you can see I have an option to add a global colour. So I will click on add a global colour and it comes up here and it offers me this. Now, the reason it did that was this palette is a system palette. We know it's a system palette because it has the apple next to it. So actually, there's a quicker way to do it rather than doing this. I will cancel that. I will go back in and I will choose Bruno's palette, which was this one. In fact, that colour looks rather nice. Quite like that one. But what I need to do when I say add global colour, let's add that global colour. I'm going to add it into here and I actually could do with it being that colour. Well, I have that palette picker, the colour picker I can drag across and that will let me add it up there. And I can put in there Bruno Brown. There is a danger with it being a global colour calling it brown, but you can work that out as I work through this. So I will add that and it adds it to my palette. We will need to zoom in on this one. Bruno Brown has a little triangle in the lower corner and that means something. But you know what applications are like when they tell you things with little symbols and stuff and you're thinking, well, what does that mean? I find the road traffic signs like that in Milton Keynes. There's all hieroglyphics on them and I have no idea what they mean. Well, what that triangle means is that that is a global colour which will mean nothing to you yet, but it will do shortly. So it is a global colour. I'm going to go through and I'm going to select the other instance of Bruno and that buy now button and make them all Bruno Brown. So I go back to the client with it and the client says, hmm, no, I think it needs to be more orangey. Fantastic. So I'm going to come back in and I'm going to right click on Bruno Brown and edit the fill. And you want it more orangey, more flamish. You want it more like that, uh, maybe more red like that. Let's make that go up there. So not pinky, just red, quite lurid red. Now uh, there, there, that will do. Now you should have noticed a couple of things happening and one thing that didn't that you might have expected. So the first thing that's happening is the Bruno text at the bottom and the by now at the top are both changing. In fact, if I make them blue, they'll both go blue. And as I go around the color wheel, Oh, they're automatically updating. That's what it means when it says global colour. It means you will define it. And when you redefine it, anywhere you have applied it will automatically update. It's fantastic. It's amazing. Love it. But the one thing that didn't happen that you might have expected to happen was that that first one, the one we defined the colour from, the one in the top left, that's not changing. Why is that not changing? Shouldn't that be changing? Well, Shouldn't it? Shouldn't. Um, it should in terms of it was Bruno Brown when it started, but we didn't apply the global colour. We just had it set randomly to the same colour. By coincidence, it happened to be the same colour value, but it wasn't actually Bruno Brown. It did not have Bruno Brown applied to it. We go and select it and now apply Bruno Brown to it and then go back in and edit that fill again. Now all three will update. As long as you've actually applied the colour swatch with the global colour in it, it will automatically update it. Anyway, the clients decided they're going with that hideous purple. But as I say, clients are always right. That's what it means when you have a global colour. Now, this is one of the reasons that you have to think carefully about where you are going to put your colours. Because in the system palettes, if I go to one of my system palettes, so let's go to my Golden Beach palette. There it is. And I want to add this colour to it. So I want to add that, but I want to add it as a global colour. Well, I can go and say add a global colour and I can go and grab that colour and I could call that um, bad purple. So I can actually add that colour. But when I add it, it's automatically done something and this could have happened to you and you then get very confused 
what on earth have you just done? All my other colours have disappeared. We have a look. I've now only got this one colour. Where did my other colours go? And it now says document, which is great. And it's got the document icon. So therefore, you should now know enough to know this is a new document palette. But why did it do that? Because I actually wanted it added to Golden Beach. Well, Golden Beach is a system palette and system palettes cannot contain global colours. Oh, dear. So that's one of the reasons to use either application palettes or document palettes. Document palettes is the place I would put those. Um, so global colours, put them in document palettes. What I would need to do is transfer my other colours into this. But that's why it did that. If I go back, my golden beach thing will still be there. Uh, I've not lost anything. Yeah, there they all are. I actually seem to have a colour in there that's telling me it is global. That's interesting because it automatically added it to my document. It created a new one. So mm, not too sure why it's doing that because I, my understanding is they need to be in a document palette. Now, the thing with a document palette is if I switch back to Golden Beach and I will zoom in so you can see something appears and disappears clue it's between those two icons there between the palette icon and the transparency palette and it appears when you choose a document palette and what it is is an extra button and this one will allow you to add the current color to a palette as a global color so that means if i go and choose a color so let's go and pick up that one um, and let me select that box. That, that colour is the one that's selected. I don't have to go through all the rigmarole of add a new colour, make it global, all of that. I can just click on there and it will automatically add it as a global. You know it's global when it's got the hieroglyphic triangle. That indicates that colour is global. So lots of different ways to work with colour. We've looked at creating palettes. We've looked at importing palettes. We've looked at working with system palettes. One of the things that you can do with, and I know if you're using Affinity Photo, you don't care about Photoshop, it costs a fortune. But Photoshop and Creative Cloud have this thing going on. And this thing that's going on is that you can take photographs of things. And the colours you have got in that photograph, you can automatically load in. Now, you know that you can do that. You'd have to take a photograph, you'd have to download it to your computer, open it up in Affinity Photo, and then say, make me a palette from that. A little bit long winded, isn't it? Mm, could do with that circumventing somewhat. So I'm going to be incredibly ambitious here and um, I'll go distant as I'm doing this if I can actually do it. So let's let's try something amazing because you can do this for free and it involves Creative Cloud, but it's OK. It's still for free. What I'm going to do is share my phone. So I am uh, cranking up my AirPlay and uh, hopefully it will let me airplay it. There we are. It is. It's letting me airplay it. So what I've got here is Adobe Capture. And what I'm going to do with Adobe Capture is tap it. And this is a colour palette that I've got. But I'm just going to add that and I'm going to go through all of that and save it. Because this is what it looks like. Oh, and that's crashed as well. Oh, for crying out loud. Right, let's start again. No, don't send that because you'll only do it again. Right. This is Adobe Capture. Adobe Capture is a free application for your iOS device. It used to be Adobe Color and before that it used to be Adobe Cooler. So if you go that far back, it's the same thing. The only difference is it's more complicated. It does lots of different things, but we're only interested in the colors. Those are color palettes that I have actually created. What I would like to do is to take a photograph of something and get it imported. And that's what I'm going to do now. So I will probably go distant as I scoot across the room to my other desk where I have my pills lined up. You've got a sneak peek of that photo. I took that. I tried this to make sure it worked and that's gone so well tonight, hasn't it? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn a light on. I'm going to get my camera up and you'll be able to see it. So I'm uh, going to go to add and I'm choosing camera and there's my desk and there are my pills. I'm going to turn a light on. So you can see it. And as I hover over it, you can see that it's making a palette. So that palette's changing. And what I have done is I have just tapped the screen once so I can bring it back to my main work desk and start working with it. Oh, it's picked lots of dark, horrible ones, hasn't it? That's not impressive. But the red's OK. I like the red. Don't want the desk, though. So I'm going to physically drag that over to the purple. 
and pick up part of the purple. So I want to take you into the purple. Are you going to move into the purple? You're not moving into the purple, are you? I'll pick up from over here then. Be awkward. See if I care. Uh, no, I don't want to go that. I want to go back to here and sort it out. So I want a blue. I want an orange. That's a little bit pasty, isn't it? I'd rather have it a little bit more blue. Would really like that purple, but it would need to have been nearer to do that. So I have a colour palette there at the top. That I've taken from my vitamin pills. I rattle when I walk. Right, so that's the palette that I'm interested in. To, to a, save that, at the moment, what it's done is it's frozen on the screen. It's actually frozen on the screen. And I haven't actually taken the image yet. I need to tap that white button at the bottom. So I'm going to do that. And I've, I've saved the image. Now I can tweak those even further. So if I think that middle one isn't quite blue enough, I'd like it to be a little bit more blue, then I can crank that up so it's more blue. I could also tap on that yellow one and make that a little bit brighter. So I'm now tweaking this ever so slightly with the uh, sliders. And then I'm going to go into next. It's going to let me name it. That's not helpful. I'll call it pills because it is. Um, and make discoverable is set to on. What that's talking about is Adobe Color. We don't want that. So I'm turning that off. I want this to be private. Private color file only to me. And it actually shows you the image at the bottom as well. And then I'm going to save the color theme. And it saved it. It's that top one. It saved it. Right. So that was using my phone with a free app from Adobe and my Adobe Creative Cloud ID. Now I can lose the phone. So I can get rid of the phone completely, which I will do by closing down the application. It's a long story all about this, but let's get back to Bruno. Right, so I've done that. But how do I get that on my Mac? I'm actually going to get a website up here and um, helpfully it signed me out of it. So bear with me while I get signed back in. Right, this is the Adobe Color website. And I'm logged in as me. I do have a Creative Cloud subscription, but I have tried this with people who do not have a Creative Cloud subscription. They just have a free Adobe ID and it works. So what I've got here is, this is an interface that you can play with to your heart's content. If you don't want an Adobe ID, you can still use it. I will show you a way to use it if you don't want an Adobe ID. But if you have an Adobe ID, fantastically, the free application on the phone, the free service on the web, and your Adobe ID to link the two together means that you can load in your themes. And here are all my themes coming in. And there is the one that I made in shape called Pills today. There's my color. So what I can do is I can click on it and get to see information about it. So I can see the color values here. I can preview it. I can do all sorts there. But at this point, I am still, sadly, not in Affinity Photo. This would be because whereas Adobe Color or Cooler, as it was known, used to allow you to export ASE files, which, as we now know, we can import. Now it doesn't. That's not kind. That's not good. But as long as you can see it, you can get to it. So what I could do, because I do have a subscription, is load it into Photoshop, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it in here and I'm going to let you see that you can do it too. I'm using a free application to take a screenshot of that screen. The application is called Snappy App and you can find it in the Mac App Store. And I can take a screen cap like that and it flashes that cap up on my screen and it will let me leave it there like that. I will show you that again. I am just going to take a screenshot. You will notice that I'm not capturing anything but the colours. I am not capturing any of the brown around it. I don't want to do that. And this app, this snappy app, lets that sit on the screen. But it doesn't matter whether it does or not, really. So I'll close it down. That's all I need to do on the Adobe site. Now I can lose it. Don't care about Adobe. Don't want to pay for that, really. So I can lose it. Right. Now I need to go and get that file. So what I will do is show you this application called Snappy App. There is my Snappy App. And in here, I've got the applications that I've taken screenshots of. And that is the one I'm looking at. That's the narrow one I just took and that one I just took. And I'm going to drag and drop it out onto my desktop. And that's it. That's all I need to do with it. I've got my colour swatches down here. 
and it was called Pills. Now, once it's on my desktop, it's an image, isn't it? And once it's an image, you should know the next step. To get that into here, I need to go to Create Palette from Image. I need to select the image, which is on my desktop. It's called Pills. There's the image. Open it up. It's picked, it's not put them in the right order, but it's picked the right colors. And then all I need to do is click Create. And I have a new Swatches palette with the colors in that I took from a photograph in an Adobe application, used my Adobe ID to transfer to the website, and then sneakily took into Affinity Photo, which I think is fantastic. It's completely free. It's amazing. They've tried to make it difficult, but they can't outwit us, can they? We can always outwit them. And that, that's how I outwit them doing that with it. So let's toggle that off. So we have looked at quite a bit, haven't we? Uh, we started off with the uh, colours, went on to swatches, started working through palettes. Uh, we have taken quite a detour with the palettes, but I think it's important to appreciate with the palettes, the different types of palettes and why you would be doing that in different ways. Uh, why you need those different palettes and how you can leverage those palettes in different ways. Uh, just one more thing to show you, which is you can get palettes online. You can get to different sites and you can download them in lots of different formats. So I've got a few here just to show you. So I will uh, bring this on. I'm pretty concerned about this site in particular because uh, it has adverts on it and I, I'm always concerned what I'm about to see. But what I've got here, I've searched for beach. It's called colorlovers.com and I've searched for beach and I've been given all of these palettes. And when I find one that I like, I can open it up and I can see information about it. So I did. I've opened up a few here. These are the adverts that I'm talking about that I'm always very concerned about. All right, this one's called Beach Flags. It's got a few ranges of colours in it. Uh, you can download it in lots of different formats. So you can get it for your screen. You can preview it. You can get an iPhone version, all kinds of different sizes. But you can also work down here and you can get download options. Now, before you use any of these colours, I would suggest you read the palette licence. This one, credit must be given. So Wasp Summer, thank you very much for doing that colour swatch. We're using it tonight in our training. And these are the download options you've got. You can download it in lots of different formats, a CS file, SVG, design files, all kinds of stuff, including ASEs, which we know Affinity Photo will import. ACO files, which it won't, but you can download them and you can convert them. AI files, HTML, or a zip file. And a zip file will download all of the available formats in a single file. And you can then open it and play along with it. So I'll download that. That will download there. And these are just some of the others that I picked. This one's called Friend. There was a summer palette there. Uh, summer of 85. Sadly, I can remember the summer of 85. That did actually sum it up, so that's pretty good. Uh, and again, you can do exactly the same. You can download an individual format or you can just download the zip file of the entire one. And uh, that one again is credit must be given. So thank you to Patrick's for doing that color swatches. I quite like that palette, really like that one. So these are the things that you can download. Now at the bottom, you can see it downloading. So I'm, I'm peeking over an iPad here if I'm sounding strange. And I'm going to uh, unzip that. So I've uh, clicked on it to unzip it and it has unzipped it for me. So just to show you what I've got over here, this is the, these are the two I downloaded. This one I've unzipped and there are all the files that are in there. There's the ACO file, the AI file, the ASE file. So all of these files. What I want to do is add that ASE file into Affinity Photo. So I'm going up to here. I'm going to get to add a document palette. Uh, no, I don't want to add a document. No, I want to import a palette. Come on. Import as a document palette. Choosing my downloads folder. Going into the folder, choosing that ASE. And as you can see, that's the only file that Affinity Photo will actually import. The ASE file and open that up. And it's added it for me, summer of 85. So now I can carry on and I can use that as long as I credit Patrick's with it. So that's just one place that you can get these files, but there are a million online that you can get them from. And as I've said, if you are stuck because you're thinking, oh, I don't want to buy that application, then just take a screenshot and load it in. The trick with taking a screenshot is don't include any of the interface elements. Just take what is actually the colours and then it will create a palette for you. 
Okay, so I'm going to go back out and do a quick recap of all that because, oh, there was a lot, wasn't there? There was a lot that we looked at. We looked at the fact that there are RGB color spaces, CMYK, lab and gray. They are all there in there by default. I recommend sticking with the default one uh, if you are in any way unsure. We then looked at the global color picker, which is available from the color panel, the swatches panel and various interface elements as you go through there. Inside your color panel, you have options. The default is the color wheel. But there is also options for sliders, boxes and tints. And when you change that, you get different elements in there. So this one, you can use the sliders and you've got that spectrum at the bottom. When you go into the boxes, you have a whole range of a hue at the bottom and you can change the hue in the slider. So there's all of these options that are available. This last one was the tint. You don't see too much when you pick white there, but uh, that was tinting colours. But we then went on to look at the global colour picker because the global colour picker uh, gives you different options. That was the one that gave you averages and things like that. When I was talking about the default, that is the default. It's called SRGB IEC 6 1966-2.1. Hmm, not exactly catchy, but that's the default one. And if you work in that, you can always convert the colour profile at a later date when you've got information that you might need from printers or etc. anything like that. So you will get information. They will say, well, we'd like you to use this colour profile and then you can change it. Now, the important thing to remember between the colour pickers is the things, the differences. So the colour picker itself, you can choose from anywhere on the screen. It supports multiple screens. You saw me pick one note off a different screen, but it's a two step process. You've got to select it and then you've got to click again to apply it. But it is pervasive across the interface. You can go across the entire interface, across your entire screens. Whereas the colour picker tool only works in the design area, but it's faster, potentially 50% faster because it's a single step process. You also have presets for that and those presets allow you to select an average colour. So if you're picking from a sky or maybe um, an area of grass of various greens, you can get an average colour. Then we moved on and started looking at colour palettes and swatches. And there were three different types, which can be very confusing. But once you've got it, incredibly powerful. There are document swatches, document palettes. There are document uh, application palettes and there are system palettes. The system palettes are system wide. They are used in other applications. The application palettes are per this single install of Affinity Photo. And the document palettes live inside the document. One of the holy grails is selecting uh, is being able to use the same colors in Photoshop or any other application and Affinity Photo. And you can use the shared swatches. You can export from Photoshop. And if you can export in ASE, you can import them straight away into Affinity Design, uh, Affinity Photo. If not, if you can only export as ACO, you need to do a little bit of extra work to get them in. But you can work with the same swatches in both applications because Affinity um, Photoshop will export ASE or ACO. If possible, go for ASE. There are possibly little advantages to using ACO. It's a newer file format, etc. But ASE is much more configurable in terms of being shareable across applications. To get those files, those three file types into Affinity Photo, you really need an ASE. If you're going for ACO, you're going to have to convert it, but you can also open CLR files. CLR files, quick reminder, are the default file format for the Mac OS color picker, which I said don't underestimate. And I have a video on that. So go to my channel, do a quick search. There is a 25 minute video which will teach you all of the secrets of the OS color picker. Um, so don't underestimate that. It has hidden depths, particularly when it comes to working with the palettes. Now, the palettes inside the color picker and the ACO files, I worked with the color palette importer to convert them from a file format that Affinity Photo can't read into one that it actually can. And that is $1.99 from the App Store. I will make sure there is a link in the notes under the video. We then used an application. And uh, what we did was we went into Adobe Capture. That was on my phone and I took a photograph. We then uploaded it to Adobe Color and took it down from there and put it in Affinity Photo. 
So we use two free services or applications from Adobe. Then I showed you how you could get colors from the internet using sites such as Color Lovers. Just to wrap up completely, the application I was using to take my screenshots was called Snappy App. It's an amazing application. I can't believe it's free, but you will find it in the Mac App Store. It is brand newly released as well. There is a brand new update yesterday. Um, I've used it for a long time because I like to have screenshots floating above all my other windows. But just to be able to take screenshots and have a library of them to go back to is a very good way to back up your color palette because you can actually just take a snap and leave it in the library of Snappy App. So you can't beat Snappy App for doing things like that with. OK. Thank you if you have made it this far. Been a long session, but a valuable one, I hope. As I said, when I started researching colour in Affinity Photo, it was like, oh, what's going on? Don't know what all of this is about. And I actually took some time out and made sure when I did that, that I understood the whole thing. And I thought, whoa, this is incredibly powerful. So if you have made it this far, I hope you have gained a lot from that and can utilise it to save yourself time and effort in the future when you're working in Affinity Photo. What I'm going to do now is go and take uh, questions and answers. And um, we, there is another session that is running very shortly. If you're watching the video, it will be available on my channel where we do all of this again, but this time for Affinity Designer. So I will be back with that shortly. But until next time, I will say goodbye. Uh, I wish you well with it. Love to hear from you. So uh, let me know how you're getting on with everything. And I will see you next time.